Hello, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Weber. I'm a medical oncologist at the Laura and Isaac Perlmutter Cancer Center at NYU Langone Health here in New York City. And I'm going to talk to you today about a, a new strategy that I think will have a significant impact on patients with melanoma and in general on patients with cancer. Uh, the title of my little talk is Neoantigen Vaccines with Checkpoint Inhibition, a novel adjuvant strategy for melanoma and other cancers. And whenever I give a talk, the lawyers insist that I show my disclosures. If anybody has any questions, I'm sure you can contact me and ask questions. Uh, let's go back one. Um, one of the biggest problems in the cancer treatment field is the sort of the uh, holy grail of cancer therapy and prevention has been the generation of a cancer vaccine. Everybody wants to be able to go to the freezer and your pharmacy and pull out a vaccine that you could administer to patients who perhaps had early stage cancer, but at a risk for having a return or even had late stage cancer, maybe had it resected surgically, moved, and again, are at risk for having it come back. The problem is in 50 years of trying, no one's come up with an effective cancer vaccine. And uh, one of the biggest problems is most of the previous strategies depended on immunizing patients against substances that were overexpressed on cancer, but also present on normal cells. And the problem is the body has tolerance to that. Early in, in life, you have a thymus. We all have or had a thymus. And in that thymus, cells that could react against normal tissues are eliminated. That's what the thymus does for a living. As we get older, the thymus involutes, it kind of shrivels away and you don't really need it because it does its thing when you're young. In fact, it does most of its work before the age of 10. But the major important discovery over the last decade was of neoantigens because sequencing, and we call it whole exome sequencing or next generation sequencing, revealed that many cancers have mutations, meaning genetic changes in the genetic sequence or changes in the genetic sequence that encode proteins or that actually encode RNA and the, the RNA makes protein that are different in the tumor and they're normal in the regular tissue. So in the regular tissue, you don't have the mutations. In the tumor, you have the mutations. Some tumors have a lot of mutations, like melanoma can have up to a thousand mutations per, per tumor. That's a huge number whereas breast cancer might have 40 or 50, leukemia might have 10 or 20. So it depends, but virtually all cancers have mutations that change the genetic sequence that encode a protein present only in the tumor, not in the normal tissue. And there have been a number of trials of small fragments called peptides uh, of these altered protein sequences present in the tumors. There have actually, or has actually been one RNA vaccine trial where the RNA that actually encodes the protein was injected into patients and it encoded only the mutated neoantigens, not the normal tissue. And because the mutated abnormal proteins are not present in embryonic life, you can't develop tolerance to them even if you have a thymus because they develop way late in adult life and you don't become tolerant to them. So you could generate an immune response against them. And up at the top where that red circle is, those are the neoantigens. And a number of those trials show that, yes, you can generate an immune response against these neoantigens. Yes, it's safe. It looks promising. But to show that it's truly effective, you need to do a randomized study. And you'll hear in a few minutes about the results of that randomized study. And here is just headlines from major league publications showing that there have been all kinds of vaccines in small numbers of patients, 10 to 30 patients. A lot of it's melanoma, but if you look at the lower left, it's lung cancer. If you look at the lower right, in uh, Nature, there was an article about a personalized RNA neoantigen vaccine in pancreatic cancer. But look at the headline of the article. It says the vaccine stimulates T cells. The problem with doing a small study in 10, 20, 30 patients is the best you can do is show that it actually generates an immune response and is safe. You can't prove that it's effective because showing that it's effective takes a randomized study, and you can do it two ways. You can do a randomized phase two study in one to 200 patients to get preliminary evidence that your vaccine with a drug that's already approved for melanoma, for example, versus just the already approved drug looks better 
that is the combination beats the control arm. Or you can do a thousand patient or a 2000 patient randomized study that costs, you know, 80 million, 100 million dollars to definitively show it. I'm a conservative person. I believe in doing the first step first. You do the small randomized phase two study and that's what you're gonna hear about. Here's a very complicated picture. Just look at the left-hand side. This came out of Nature, published a couple of months ago, a trial from MD Andrew, or from uh, MSK, rather. Very interesting trial. This is pancreatic cancer patients who are surgically resected. That is, they had early stage pancreas cancer, but the risk of them uh, having it return is probably 80% at a couple of years. And if you look down in the lower left, you see two curves of recurrence-free survival. That is, what's the risk that the tumor is going to come back? And in a small number of patients, there were only 16 patients that got the vaccine. The red line shows that nobody relapsed in the group that had an immune response, but the blue line shows that almost everybody relapsed in the group that didn't have an immune response to the neoantigen vaccine, which suggests that maybe we should be vaccinating patients after surgical removal and try to prevent the tumor from coming back. And is there any evidence other than that, that there's clinical benefit? Well, for, to be honest, not a lot. Look at the second bullet point. There was a trial of an RNA vaccine against neoantigens and 20 patients were treated and six of them had shrinkage, but it was given with a drug called pembrolizumab, which has activity against melanoma. And there was another one. There was another RNA vaccine. It had a name. It was called RO719875. It was given with another drug called atezolizumab. You know, they only had two responses in 28 patients. That's not very impressive. That's 7%. And they treated a whole bunch of different patients with advanced cancer, kind of hard to say. And then some colorectal cancer patients were treated. There were only seven and none of them had tumor shrinkage, but three of the seven were alive with a median survival of eight months. And the authors said, oh, well, that's a good thing because most of them die by six months. As you can tell, doing small studies in patients with advanced cancer with a vaccine approach ain't gonna get you much because it's very difficult to tell if it really works. So what I advocated and what some other folks have advocated is the way to use a vaccine against cancer is in the patients whose tumors arise and then get surgically removed, they're at risk of relapse or return of the tumor. But at the time you vaccinate them, A, there's no tumor. B, it gives you time to make the vaccine. C, it gives you time to repetitively vaccinate the patient and get a good immune response. Now, the complication is that in these patients, we call these high-risk resected patients in melanoma, there is effective adjuvant therapy. And this shows where it says Keynote 054. It shows the recurrence-free survival of patients in blue who got the drug pembrolizumab, which is an immune stimulant, versus placebo, no treatment in red. And it says you obviously do better in the blue curve than the red curve. And if you go out to five years, there's a big difference. It's like 17%. And that's a big deal. And this, of course, got pembrolizumab approved by the FDA. And there's also another similar drug called nivolumab, which was approved earlier. So these are drugs that are effective. So if you're going to do a vaccine in patients with melanoma that's surgically removed and determine how quickly they have return of the tumor or relapse or recur, the control arm has to be that drug. And in the case of the trial we did, it was pembrolizumab, which is whose data is shown there. The experimental arm is the vaccine with the pembrolizumab. So you do vaccine with pembro versus pembro alone. And that's the ethical appropriate way to do it. And the way you do it is it's a little complicated. If you look at the left-hand picture, you have to take a tumor biopsy. And all that you need is two millimeters. Two millimeters is like two pencil points. It's tiny. And you take that tumor and you remove the nucleic acids by dissolving it in a sterile solution. And you get the RNA and you can sequence the RNA and the DNA, the genetic components. And that takes a week or so. And that uses 21st century technology. Oops. And you then can determine where are the mutations that are in the tumor that are not in the normal tissue because you also sequence the blood, which is normal. And then you can take 10, 20, 30. It turns out you can actually have 34 of these little sequences of protein. They're like 25 amino acids. They're what we call peptides, fragments of proteins. 
you take the sequence in the RNA, you run it together, that's called concatenating it. That just means you put them together. And you make one RNA molecule. You manufacture it, it's not hard to do, it uses 20th century technology. And that's your vaccine and you administer it in a way that stabilizes the RNA because RNA can be easily chopped up in the body. So you encapsulate it with these nanoparticles that protects it from being degraded and you vaccinate the patients with sequences of the neoantigens that their immune system will recognize determined by what's called their HLA molecules. And we all have six HLA class one molecules. We're all different, but you have to tailor it to each individual's HLA molecule. And that's not hard because you get that information from the sequence. And at a cellular level, here's what happens. Look at the upper left. You have that little RNA molecule. It's encapsulated in this little capsule to protect it. It gets into the cell, the cell gobbles it up. You inject it in the muscle and it gets into the muscle cells, it gets into other cells in the body. And it meets up with one of the little factories in the cell that takes the RNA and translates it into protein. And that's a normal function. We all have ribosomes in all our cells. And you end up with a protein chain that's a concatenated bunch of these little peptides. And it then makes its way to what I call the garbage disposal of the cell that's called the proteasome. That's that light blue thing and right in the middle. And the proteasome digests and chops up proteins. And if they're useless proteins, it gets rid of them. If they're good proteins, they get into another structure that's at the lower right called the endoplasmic reticulum. And they meet up with what's called the MHC molecules. And if you look at the right-hand side, it says vesicle. Those little structures are the MHC molecules that stick a peptide within themselves, and then they get transported to the surface of the cell, and they can be recognized by your immune cells. So the RNA is outside the cell, gets in, uncoats, translates in the ribosome, makes a protein. Protein is chopped up. The chopped up pieces of protein are called peptides. They meet up in the endoplasmic reticulum, which leads to the, it says Golgi apparatus. Golgi was a guy, by the way, that they named this after, and eventually makes its way to the surface with the MHC molecules. And this is exactly the strategy that Moderna used and BioNTech, Pfizer used for the COVID vaccines. And it obviously worked really well for COVID, but I'll remind you this strategy for melanoma started before the COVID pandemic. So just before the COVID pandemic began, a randomized phase two trial was done. This is a flip of the coin. Now we don't really flip a coin, it's done by a computer. But patients had combination of the RNA vaccine with the standard drug pembrolizumab for up to one year, or that was in red, or they had the control arm. That's the pembrolizumab alone. That's an FDA approved drug. You had to have that. And it was 107 patients to 50 because it's what we call a two to one randomization. Two to one randomization means for every person who gets the control treatment pembrolizumab to get the good stuff, the combination. <coughs> Excuse me. And it took six weeks to make the vaccine. So everybody started their pembrolizumab, which is given in the veins every three weeks. And at the time of the third dose of the pembro, you added in the vaccine. You gave nine vaccines over the next 30, whatever, 30 weeks or 36 weeks. And there, 27 weeks to be exact, sorry. And then you finished off the year with just the pembro alone. And what was the primary endpoint, the thing we were aiming to see? recurrence-free survival. We wanted to see, did people in the control arm recur later or not recur at all compared to those in the control arm? We also wanted to look for something called DMFS, distant metastasis-free survival. Because if you never distantly metastasize or spread, you're not going to die of melanoma. You could spread in the area of the original tumor, and usually that can be surgically removed. That won't kill you. But if you metastasize to the brain, the bone, the lungs, the liver, that's going to kill you. So we looked at recurrence-free survival, what was the likelihood that the tumor returned, and what was the likelihood that it spread distantly. And if you look at the side effects and the safety, big, lot of information. But if you look at the upper group in bold, it says immune-mediated AE. AE means adverse event, means toxicity. If you look at that, you will see that the percentage of patients with any grade, meaning we call them grade one, two, three, four, adverse event was 35% in the combination, 36% with just the pembrolizumab. And that's pretty darn good. That would suggest that there's no real increase in 
the immune mediated toxicity, but there was more toxicity to the vaccine, right? Because anytime you get a vaccine like COVID, your arm hurts, you get fevers, you get chills, you feel crappy for a day or two. And that definitely happened. But for 88% of the patients, it was minor. We called that low grade. And for some of them, it was high grade and they felt pretty lousy for a day or two. But at our institution, everybody continued the vaccine and nobody stopped it because of vaccine related side effects. So that means A, it's well tolerated, B, the vaccine related side effects were not so bad. And here's the punchline. This is the curve of recurrence. So on the bottom is time, so time goes to the right. On the vertical axis is the likelihood that you're gonna recur. It's actually the inverse, it's the recurrence-free survival. So the higher you are, the better off you are. The closer you are to 100%, the lower the likelihood that you're gonna recur. And I much would rather be on that red curve of recurrence than the black curve. The red curve is the combination, the black curve is just the pembrolizumab, the standard. And by the way, the standard curve here in black looks exactly like the curves of protocols in which pembrolizumab was tested and approved. So it reproduces what you would expect with pembrolizumab. But there's an increment, an increase in recurrence-free survival with adding the vaccine, and that's a big deal. And the difference, what we call the hazard ratio, is 0.56. Hazard ratio is the difference between adding something and not adding it. So if it's less than one, that means it was better to add it, meaning the risk of recurrence, if the hazard ratio is 0.56, the risk of recurrence was decreased by 44%. In our business, that's a big deal. And if you look at the other endpoint, which is distant metastasis-free survival, it looks pretty good. Now, you also should look at the left side of the curve. The curves don't, don't break apart till late, which would imply the benefit of the vaccine takes time to occur. But once time has passed, by 18 months, there was a 13 percentage point difference in the distant metastasis-free survival, and it looks like it continued to stay apart. There's two years of follow-up, and those curves, again, this time the hazard ratio is 0.34. The lower the hazard ratio, the more the benefit of the treatment arm versus the control. A hazard ratio of 0.34 means a 66% reduction in the risk of distant metastasis occurring. And again, that's a pretty big deal. And in addition, another experiment was done where we subdivided the patients by whether you could detect circulating tumor-specific DNA at the time of surgery. If you have surgery, the tumor is removed, and then you do a blood test a month later, and you can still detect circulating tumor DNA, even if all the scans are negative, that's not good. Those patients do badly. And if you look at the patient's who were negative, those are the dotted or dashed lines. Red is better than black if you're circulating DNA negative. So that means the patients who do well do even better if they get the vaccine. And if you look at the vaccine recurrent, the distant metastasis free survival, it's up at 100%. That means nobody develops a distant metastasis in the good group who have DNA negative in the blood. If you look at the DNA positive in the blood, even then, the red line is better than the black line. Look at the black line of the ctDNA positive who only get the pembrolizumab. They all recur. They all develop distant metastases. Whereas it's much more prolonged in the bad acting group, as we call them, in red when they get the vaccine with the pembrolizumab. So whatever group you take, the good group, the bad group, the in-between group, you're better off getting the combination of the vaccine with the standard pembrolizumab than the pembrolizumab alone. So what are the conclusions? We clearly showed a clinically significant improvement in the likelihood of recurring, meaning return of the tumor, and in the likelihood of distant metastasis-free survival, which means the likelihood of developing a distant spread of the tumor. If you give the combination of the vaccine with the pembrolizumab compared to the pembrolizumab alone, a 44% 44 reduction in the risk of recurrence or death, and a 66% reduction in the risk of the distant metastases with two years of follow-up. This was the first randomized trial to show improvement in an important endpoint using an individualized neoantigen vaccine in cancer. All other trials have been single-arm studies where you can't prove that it benefits the patient because you don't have a control arm. We thought it was pretty well tolerated. 
there was extra or additional side effects added by the vaccine, as you would expect, just like with COVID. But in general, the opinion was it was well tolerated. Currently, this vaccine combined with pembrolizumab is being compared to pembrolizumab alone in a large randomized trial of a thousand patients with a similar strategy, two to one randomization, which for a patient, in my view, is an attraction. And this was given what they call breakthrough designation by the FDA and prime designation by the European Medicines Agency earlier this year. And this trial has already started accruing. It's going to go for another year. And in a year beyond the end of that study, which is two years from today, I hope there'll be enough events, an event being a recurrence or a death, so that you can break the code and find out where there are fewer events in the combination than in the control, which is the sought after goal. If that is the case, and it's wide enough, a big enough difference, then an application will be made to the FDA. It'll be prepared, made to the FDA. The FDA then gets six months to respond. And about three years from today, if all goes well, that vaccine will be approved for melanoma and it'll go into patients. Now, there are a lot of next steps. For example, we need to get more data from the original randomized study I just described. We need to see how durable is the effect of the treatment. I already told you there's a phase three study that was initiated, but this type of neoantigen vaccine would have relevance for non-small cell lung cancer, for head and neck cancer, kidney cancer, hepatocellular cancer, esophageal, gastric, you name it. Any cancer where there's well-known documented neoantigens that occur, which is most cancers, would potentially be able to have benefit from a neoantigen vaccine approach. So there's going to be a whole franchise that gets set up in the future, I assume, by both Merck, which is pursuing this particular strategy with Moderna, and BioNTech, which I believe will pursue it with Genentech and or Pfizer. So I think there's going to be a lot of neoantigen action in the next five years. And my prediction is this is yet one more incremental step in the eradication of cancer as a major source of mortality in our lifetime. And again, I thank you for your time.